Ethereum staking is one of those things that sounds simple until you look closer. Lock up some ETH, earn rewards, help secure the network. But what's actually happening under the hood? Ethereum, like many blockchains, depends on thousands of people around the world running its software on computers, called nodes. Some of these nodes are called validators. Their job is to check transactions, bundle them into blocks, and suggest those blocks to the network. In return, the network rewards them with more ETH. But not just everyone can jump in. To become a validator, you have to stake 32 ETH and put it up as collateral, like a security deposit for good behavior. 32 ETH isn't exactly pocket change, but it wasn't plucked from thin air. It's designed to be high enough to encourage serious commitment, but not so high that only billionaires can participate. Too few validators, and the network risks centralization, too many, and coordinating them all would slow things down. When it's time to add a new block, the network chooses one validator at random. It works like a lottery. Every validator has tickets, and staking more ETH means more tickets. That boosts your chances, but never guarantees a win. And here's the nuance. The chosen validator doesn't always build the block themselves. They can rely on block builders, specialized actors who gather up transactions and assemble the block. The validator then proposes it to the network. Other validators check the block's accuracy, and if everything looks good, it's added to the chain. The proposer earns the main reward, and those who helped verify it get smaller ones. It's a rhythm of propose, check, agree, repeated every few seconds to keep Ethereum secure and running. Of course, if a few players hold too many tickets, they could dominate block production and tilt the system in their favor. That's why decentralization matters, and Ethereum works best when validators are independent and evenly distributed. Now back to that security deposit. If a validator cheats, say by proposing conflicting blocks, they get punished through something called slashing. Part of their stake is destroyed, and they're suspended from the network for a while. Sounds harsh, but slashing is reserved for serious misbehavior. Smaller slip-ups, like going offline briefly, usually just mean missed rewards, not losing everything. So far, what we've described is called solo staking, running your own validator. But not everyone has 32 ETH lying around, or has the technical know-how or desire to run a validator node 24-7. That's why stake pools exist, where ETH from multiple people is pooled and rewards are shared proportionally. Some pools issue a receipt token representing your staked ETH, which you can trade or use elsewhere in crypto. Centralized exchanges often run their own stake pools, which can make staking as simple as hitting a button. The trade-off for this convenience, though, is trust. If the exchange is compromised, your ETH is too and history has shown that's not something to take lightly. Staking also has built-in risks. Solo stakers have to deal with locked ETH, hardware failures, or downtime, which could lead to missed rewards or penalties. Pools and exchanges, if they grow too large, could concentrate power and weaken Ethereum's decentralization. And as more ETH is staked across the network, rewards shrink since they're divided among more validators. But staking isn't just about earning yield, it's the mechanism that lets Ethereum run securely without a central authority, aligning incentives so strangers across the globe can coordinate on a massive scale without needing to trust each other. Which, when you think about it, is pretty cool. And Ethereum didn't always work this way, you know? It used to rely on mining, just like Bitcoin. Find out how that works here.